Well, I think we're live. Hello. How are you going? I'm Trevor Cochran. This is The Garden Guru's Live, and we're bringing it to you all the way from Singapore. Um, I'm here working on a project up here at The Garden Guru's, and back in Perth at the moment, the production is Shay Lee. So I hope, um, hope we're coming through loud and clear. Certainly an uh, interesting world when we can sort of broadcast so broadly and so widely. Now, of course, the show's all about you asking questions and me answering them, and I'm really happy to do that. Uh, what I will do is just tell you briefly where I am. Have a look at this. This amazing, <clears throat> amazing hotel is the Park Royal Pickering. Now, just to give you an idea, we're uh, about five stories above the street below and uh, in the heart of bustling Singapore. Singapore is the city in a garden, there is no doubt about it. Um, these days they like to call themselves the city in nature because they're trying to encourage so many, you know, wild animals back into their, sort of into their uh, environment. So it's not unusual at the moment to see um, all sorts of very interesting animals making their way through the city because it's got all these beautiful nature corridors it's a really lovely spot. Now, big good morning to everybody. Uh, Raylene, uh, Amanda, Tyson, of course, Samantha and Kaz. Uh, straight away, I can tell you that um, we've got a lot of questions coming in. Now, don't forget today, we've got that amazing gift voucher, 50 bucks to spend at Garden Express. Online, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. It's a great deal. Um, the questions as they're coming through, I'm going to try and ask them as we go, and uh, we'll see how we go. Now, uh, Tyson's got one. Really good question, Tyson. Uh, wants to get a, a tangelo tree. He's trying to work out whether to plant it in the ground or whether maybe to have it in a pot. Well, the beauty about tangelos is they tend to be a, a smaller size tree, so you can actually have them in the ground or in a pot, Tyson. I would need, you'd want a half wine barrel to be quite honest. It's absolutely the, you know, one of those sorts of trees that would grow best in that size. So they're about 500 mils across by about 500 millimeters high. And of course, the big thing is just wondering if you're going to plant anything, particularly citrus, you've got to make sure you use the very best potting mix. Absolutely vitally critical. Now I should say also, don't forget, we've also got that amazing competition running it's um <clears throat> it's absolutely sensational uh of course it is a 250 dollar gift pack if you like it's a year's full of fertilizer uh, from the guys at troforte and it's that amazing biological fertilizer now i'm going to try um try and keep up with all the questions that they come through so i'll fly at it uh good morning christine uh first of all thanks very much um you love to sing visit singapore the last time you, you were there in 1986. I've got to tell you, the city's a dramatically changed city. It's an incredible place. And we will be showing a lot of it on uh, the Garden Gurus as, as we're going through this current season. I'm going to try and share some of the stories that I do up here for, for Singapore TV. Uh, hopefully we can do them for, for Australia as well and share the, the stories across. Um, so, uh, Carolyn Lothian, let me just go to your question. Uh, you're in Melbourne, you've got a smoke bush and wondering where is the best time to cut it back um, and how amazing is the hotel, it is amazing. Uh, Carolyn, good question and um, I, I would say to you right up front, smoke bush are better to be lightly trimmed than, than hard trimmed. You can trim it pretty much any time of the year but now's a really good time to give them a bit of a shape up. So don't cut too hard, um, cut light just to get the shape, that's the key. Sue Ellen Smith, hello, I was wondering about the root ball size for tinnias and frangipani trees, please. Small yard, concerned about pipes, thank you. Frangipanis, surprisingly not a really large root system. Uh, for tinnias actually have quite a, quite an intense root system actually, uh, quite a spreading one, so uh, hopefully that helps. Hazel King, hello, good morning to you. Please make sure you let me know where you are coming from because it really does help, okay. Hazel King. Something's eating my grapes. Um, would like to know what and how to stop them. Thank you for a great show. Hazel, um, could be any number of things. Birds, particularly if the, the sugars are up in the fruit, they're going to do that. 
Um, more likely, uh, rodents tend to like grapes if you're leaving them ripe on the on the vine. And now's the time to be harvesting. It'd be a late season grape, actually. So, yeah, it have to be uh, have to be something that's really enjoying that. Not a lot you can do. You can put some traps out, obviously, for rodents. Uh, when it comes to birds, you just have to be willing to either net the the vine or alternatively share. And uh, and that's not such a bad thing sometimes. Okay, let's go to Sue Hall. Hello, Sue. A uh, black spot on my roses. Removed all the branches and leaves and spray each two weeks. Um, but it keeps coming back within a week. Yes, all right. So black spot is traditionally caused by getting wet at night. So moisture on the foliage at night will see black spot on roses spread really rapidly and take off and really impact them. If you can stop water on them at night then great if it's just raining all the time there's not a lot you can do I'm afraid um, ventilation is another thing so if the roses are planted quite closely together that can also uh, impede airflow and, and in turn uh, that, that creates a good environment for black spot to get into roses so hopefully hopefully we'll see now Christine Rankin just gave us an update on rats as well she's had uh, the hubbies put baits out now just remember with baits that um, they're usually quite effective with rats, but then the rats are usually found wandering around half dead and, and will die. And the risk with that, of course, is that you know cats and dogs and birds uh, may well actually consume them, and that can poison them. So please be careful when you're when you're baiting. You've got to be very careful. Okay, let's go to John Allen in uh, Melbourne. And he doesn't live too far from Bonnie Marie, a beautiful place Bonnie's got up in the up in the mountains. It's absolutely fantastic in Callista, uh, and she's uh, she's on, in paradise at the moment. I saw her at the Melbourne International Flower and Garden Show, and uh, she was looking fantastic. Now, your question, John. Um, oops, I just lost you. I will come back to you. Sorry, mate. Uh, your question: uh, What's the best location for citrus trees in pots? The short answer to that is a bright, sunny position. Citrus love a nice, warm, bright position. If they're in shade, any sort of shade, they do become susceptible to things like scale and uh, sooty mold and some of those fungal diseases as well. So try and keep it in a bright, sunny spot. Uh, good if there's a lot of airflow around the outside. So pick your spot and, uh, and good luck. June LaFrance, good morning to you, June. Thanks very much. Uh, Melody, Korea. Now, I've got a lemonade tree. I've got plenty of fruit early. Uh, my problem is the fruit now has a bitter aftertaste. What can I do to remedy that? You know what? You can do something with fruit. You can actually put a little bit of potash into the soil, and it does have this habit of sweetening fruit. So it might take that bitterness away. If it's a new thing, then that, that may well be a change in the soil pH. So balance your soil pH, put some, put some um, potash in there, and it should make a, a really good a really good thing. Now, okay, we're going to keep moving. Tyson, uh, not a worry, mate. It's great having you join us. Uh, Carol, uh, Carol Bush, good to have you back. What flowers can I... And it disappears. Carol, I didn't get the rest of your question. I'll look out for it. Uh, I know it's, it's popped up a little bit further up. You're living in Riverton, which is in WA. Um, you know what? The best thing to be doing is putting in... So Carol wants to know what flowers to put in. The best things to put in right at the moment has got to be spring flowering bulbs because in a couple of months' time, you'll be seeing the benefits of that and get a beautiful start to springtime. So they're good flowers. Of course, annuals. Right now, you're starting to move into things like pansies, etc. And as the days get uh, shorter, what you're going to find is the flowers get bigger with pansies. So it's not a, not a bad plant to mass plant in garden beds if you want to brighten up wintertime. Um, okay, yeah, uh, Carolyn, Lothian, now thank you. Uh, looking forward to watching the Garden Guru show on Singapore. You'll see it regularly uh, in this series in Australia and then the series that I'm filming in Singapore, for Singapore, with, with local Singapore talent, uh, you will see middle of the year on Channel 9 or, or 9 Live. So we'll try and let you know as we go along. Okay, keep moving. Uh, it's... It is like morning line on the Garden Gurus this morning. <laughs> Thanks, Tyson. Lavinia Quick, hello. Lavinia's here in Singapore. Lavinia's, Lavinia's basically 
um, my cousin, if you like, because we've grown up together pretty much. Um, she's got a beautiful hibiscus at home that's blooming rather well, but the leaves keep falling off. How can you keep more lush hibiscus? Now, Lavinia, that's a great question. And Lavinia is right into gardening. And I've seen the photos of your place with all the pot plants. Hibiscus are a really incredible plant. If they get stressed at all, so usually that stress would come through running out of water, um, you'll find that they'll drop some leaves. And it's just because they're, they're managing it, the amount of leaves they can hold for the amount of water that's available. So the goal here is to get more consistent water holding. Now, what they tend to do is grow quite a sort of vigorous root system and fill a pot up. So repotting hibiscus on a regular basis annually is a really good idea, Lavinia. It's so nice to have you join us. That's great. It's so cool. Now, uh, Sue Hall. Thanks for all the good advice. Thanks, Sue. Tyson. Thanks, mate. Um, Sharon. Let's keep rolling on. Sharon Messengers in Adelaide. Uh, my crepe myrtles don't appear to be flowering every... Oh, don't flower every year. I did have quite a bit of growth this year uh, after their pruning, but alas, there's no flowers. Now, Sharon, when you prune your crepe myrtles is vitally important. A lot of people... Uh, prune them during the summertime and you're basically pruning uh, the right time of the year to do it then. If you prune a lot of foliage off during the winter time when they go dormant, what you're going to find is that you'll end up with a situation where you cut a lot of the flower buds off. The only other thing that affects crepe myrtles flowering consistency is the type of fertilizers you use. So if you're using a very high nitrogen fertilizer, then you, you are going to find that, um, that it really is a situation where um, that will encourage lots of growth, but not lots of flower. So hopefully that helps you in Adelaide. Remember folks, keep telling us where you're from. Jessica Mansfield has asked this question. It is all citrus today. Um, I've, I've got citrus in a citrus pot on the northern side of the house, full sun. And I think what you're really saying is you're getting great results, Jessica. I hope that's it. Uh, John says, thanks very much for answering the question. Absolutely my which are obviously an Australian um, native plant, a, a beautiful annual flower, um, have longer, little longer leaves. So their first leaves, their cotyledons, tend to be upright and longer, whereas you tend to find, oh, oh, have we got a problem here? I'm going to ask Shaylee. Um, okay, I'm going to, no, I think we're okay. Oh, uh, we've dropped out. Shall we, um, shall we reboot? Oh, I'm back. Thanks, Christine Rankin. <laughs> Technology, isn't it a wonderful thing? Um, okay, now, I, I've, I've missed Kaz, so I think um, what's going to happen is Shirley's going to pop that back up for me, hopefully, and I'll come back to you, Kaz. Oh, no, there it is. Um, so, there it is. So, let's go back. We were talking wildflowers before. Um, definitely, um, wildflowers, when you, when you think about wildflowers and you think of everlastings, they're a plant that you should be planting right now. So a uh, really, really beautiful flowering plant during the winter in Australia. Not going to do so well up here in Singapore, but, uh, but now's the time to be planting that seed. Okay, so hopefully that helps you, Linda Jones. Um, Helen Herford, uh, good morning, Trevor. I live in Melbourne, Adelaide. My hydrangeas have powdery mildew and rather quickly, um, is there a home remedy to cure this? There is actually, you can use whole milk. So um, the milk will obviously look quite cloudy over the foliage, but uh, it's full of bacteria and the bacteria tends to eat off that powdery mildew fungus. The truth of the matter is we're coming to the end of the season and the leaves are gonna fall off them in the next few weeks anyway. So whether you do it, whether you don't, it's really up to you. Uh, the important thing is that you don't have powdery mildew at the beginning of next season when the new foliage starts to come through. So it's worthwhile giving them just a little bit 
of a spray at the beginning of the season and you'll just use one of those general fungicides and you'll find them available in your local garden centre. Okay, let's just keep moving along because there's lots of questions. Kaz, your question was, how do, how do I rid the wildflowers on my block of mealy? You're in Baker's Hill. Well, I'm not sure what mealy would be and what the wildflowers are. Kaz, this might be one of those things where you need to send us a photograph. It just seems a bit odd. It's uh, not a question I don't think I've ever had before. So really good question. Remember, we've got, uh, for the best question, a $50 gift voucher today to be to be spent at Garden Express. Uh, our friends at Garden Express always support everything we do, which is so good. All right, let's keep moving along. Mel Morrow is on the Central Coast. And uh, how do you keep African violets blooming? Actually, it's a really good question. African violets like a nice, bright, sunny spot. First, first trick. Second trick that's really important is you have to use a flower-promoting fertilizer. If you use a general fertilizer for them, one that's high in nitrogen, they'll produce lots and lots of growth, but not lots and lots of flower. I used to grow them as a, as a young apprentice many, many years ago, and the fertilizer that I would go to is one called Fostrogen. Um, really good at promoting flower, flowering in those sorts of plants. And uh, I tend to use liquid as well, so just so you know. Uh, all right, and I'll go to Julie Murphy. He's got a question. She's in Perth. Got an avocado tree. It's in a big pot, really dangly, needs pruning. Is there a special way to do it? And when would be best? Now is best, Julie, as long as it doesn't have fruit on. So mine at home have fruit on, so whenever I prune, got to be careful not to cut the fruit off. Um, does not hurt to shape uh, avocados pretty much all through the year, but now's a very good time to get back into them. So hopefully that's good. Um, and Lavinia comes back to me to say she's looking forward to seeing a new perspective on the on the local scene. Of course, the gardening scene right here in Singapore. It's really cool. And uh, yeah, definitely get into that hibiscus. Bit of weekend work, a little bit of repotting, tease those roots out, really good quality potting mix, and give it a feed. It doesn't hurt as well, Lavinia, and your hibiscus will be fantastic. All right, Melody Korea. Uh, Melody. I've got a few flowers on my dragon fruit, but I don't seem to, I don't seem to be getting fruit. Oh, okay. Now, you're disappointed, you're wondering why it is. Dragon fruit are really interesting. They're, the fruit is predominantly, um, the, the, sorry, I should say the flowers are predominantly fertilized by moths at night or by ants. And ants are the best one um, to have. So, you know, when we talk about ants, in, um, in gardens, sometimes we talk about them in a negative sense, but they do a great job in pollinating a lot of these plants. And it's a really important one for the dragon fruit. Now, if you're wondering how to get ants to come to your dragon fruit, get a little bit of honey and paint it around the base of the dragon fruit plant. Uh, and ants will appear, I can assure you. It doesn't take long. Okay, Melody, um, that's great. Oh, you were telling me you live in Perth. That's great, great to know. My dragon fruit in Perth are all in flower and they're all setting fruit. So they do get better at it as they get older as well. Okay, I'm gonna to go to Leah. Um, Leah, let's have a look. What is your question? Thinking of planting a dwarf mulberry tree, any advice here in Brisbane? Um, yeah, I, look, to be quite honest, it depends on the variety. There are a few nice dwarf varieties. Uh, the ones that are gonna do best in Brisbane are the ones that uh, have a tropical um, uh, origin uh, like the chartoots and one of my favorite mulberries of all the mulberries is the red chartoot it is gorgeous I've had one in the ground at home for probably coming up three years I think and it's only maybe a meter and a half tall by a meter and a half wide it's delivering I don't know a kilo of fruit last year this year it'll probably be two kilos it's, it's more than enough for us. It's a really lovely um, way to go. If not, grow them in a pot. You can grow some of the larger growing forms. But uh, again, try and keep them, uh, keep them going. Okay. I'm just reading through all your questions. Um, Kerry McClure. Hi, Kerry. Uh, you're in Rolly Stone. Raspberry bush is dying back. Is this normal this time of year? Actually, as the weather cools down, Kerry, your raspberries will. But if it's at all dry, and, and I live in the hills as well, um, and the soils can dry out quite a lot, you will see a bit, of, a bit of foliage drop and a bit of burn on the foliage with your raspberries. So my suggestion is that um, they're probably fine, 
but maybe a bit of a soaking with sea salt just at the moment might do them the world of good. That helps plants with any kind of stress or shock. Chooks, eat mealybugs, but don't eat wildflowers. Linda Jones, that's what you were saying. Chooks are pretty good. They will eat mealybugs. They don't necessarily get them all because a lot of mealybugs are actually in the, uh, in the root system as well. But mealybug is quite a hard one to get rid of. So if, you, if you've got chooks and you can let them at them, let them go for it. Uh, Car Carol Anderson, hello. We've uh, got sheep mulch. Oh, you sheep mulched your lawn over bleach drains. Okay, so you don't want it to... You don't want to keep mowing because that's that's going to be putting a lot of growth on. I've read that native grasses like Lamandra and Carex are fine to grow there. They don't have invasive roots and are there any other plants that I would recommend? Now you're in Kendanup, which is in Western Australia. Um, Carex grasses can be a bit hit and miss to be completely honest, but Lamandras are fantastic. And some of the smaller, more compact varieties, I'm, I'm a big fan of Tanika. It's still for me, it was one of the very early releases, but it's got to be one of the very best that there is. So hopefully that helps. Let's head to Highland Park in Queensland. Jill Victorson, hello. Uh, when's the best time to plant tube stock or more established? Oh, is it, is it best time to plant tube stock or more established plants? Look, so typically as you're going into your rainy season, it's the best time to be planting tube stock. Now you're in a bit of a dry period now. So in actual fact, more established plants may be better because they've got more of a root system and as long as you can maintain a bit of water to them, they should be fine. Um, tube stock, however, in places like Victoria, South Australia, Western Australia, where there's very good winter rains, great time to be putting tube stock in. It's, um, it's absolutely fantastic. I just said this most beautiful bird fly past me. It's crazy up here in Singapore. Um, okay, hopefully that helps. Um, and, and I, sorry, and the rest of that question, I think was that you were thinking hedging plants. Um, so hedging plants by tube stock is the most cost-effective way to do it. Uh, but certainly, you know, what I said before is that you'd be best to be planting um, when you've got winter rains to settle them in. Okay, and the best way to get native tube stock to thrive once planted. Actually, Lisa Green, um, you are 100 plus kilometers west of Townsville. Jump on our Facebook page. Just have a look at some photos I did a big landscape project in Perth for the Water Corporation. We replanted all their front gardens with West Australian native wildflowers of all different sorts, all in little tubes. Now, the project had been delayed because there, there was other building going on and we were meant to have put them in during the winter. I ended up putting them in during the summer in, in November, which is the worst time. So I was really worried about the amount of loss we would have. So I put a lot of work into the soil, a lot of organic matter, and we put a big thick layer of mulch, but every single tube stock that went down, we put one of those Troforte tree planting tablets. They're a little round tablet, um, and you can buy them in, in those buckets from Troforte. If you want to find your local stockist, jump onto their website or, or go to um, your local garden center, most independent garden centers carry it. These tree planting tablets went into the ground. I am blown away with just the enormous amount of growth that these these beautiful little um, seedlings that went in so small and some of them quite overgrown and have done really well. So it's Troforte tree planting tablets. Have a look on uh, on our Facebook page. Have a look at the photos of those plants and how well they're doing. Hopefully that gives you an idea of a good way that you can get success. Okay, let's keep rolling through to Melbourne and Cheryl Stallenberg. Hello, Cheryl. Uh, I've got pedosperum hedges. They've grown high can I cut them back really hard now uh, and will they grow back you cut them back really hard you're probably going to ruin them uh, only because they tend to grow back quite straggly if you can reduce them by 25% um, without taking all of the wood and foliage off that would be the ideal scenario um, you can cut dosmas back pretty hard at times but you just do have to be very very careful and it does depend on the variety of pistols from too so Hopefully that helps. Um, Carol, thanks for telling me you're in Sydney. Um, that's great. That's Carol Rosario and Carol Anderson. You're very welcome. Thank you. Um, I have two eucalyptus spicifolias. One doesn't develop the nuts from flowers, but the other does. That is an unusual, an unusual situation. Um, and there's no reason why that would happen. So this is Cheryl and Marcus Sheridan. I'm not sure where you are located, Cheryl, but it's really quite an unusual thing. They should be forming these lovely little, um, when, when you actually, uh, when you get the flowers, so they'll, they'll food, like, produce a nut, 
in in some of the uh, calophylla and some of the other varieties of eucalyptus that produce the same sort of flower, you know, that turns into a honky nut, as we call them. And uh, so it's unusual that the biosifolias are not producing some nut and seed from one of the plants. It could be just one of those quirky little Mother Nature things. Um, yeah, and it probably will change too. So anyway, and you guys are in Mandra. Thanks very much for letting me know. Uh, Pommy Lolita, I hope I got that right, Pommy. You just said to say hello. Hello to you too. Now, uh, Colleen, we're not sure where you're from. Uh, please help you. Avocado tree keeps dropping little avocados, and I don't know what I'm doing wrong. Tree's about five years old. So there is a natural shedding process with avocados. I had a tree full of avocados this year. I was so excited. And they all got to about that big. And then the tree dropped about 70% of the crop. And what happened at the same time was we went from quite a nice moist environment in spring to summertime and things dried out. And it's that thing that, that I was sharing uh, with Lavinia here in Singapore about hibiscus. Some plants work out how much moisture there is, how much they need to sustain that fruit. And if they can't do it, they'll drop the fruit. So soil moisture consistency is vitally important. And that's where mulching, as soon as your avocado starts to set fruit, is vitally important. Now keep keep asking your questions. We've been going for 32 minutes now. And we're gonna try and go through to 10 o'clock if everything uh, goes well, we'll, we'll have a look. Um, Trish Webster. You asked me about a pineapple plant in a large pot. Um, you took it from a pineapple top, which is a great thing about them. It's in a second year, it's very healthy, and it's thrown two pups, which are quite big. Do I remove the pups from the mother plant, or is it okay to keep them? Move the, the, move the pups away. So break them off and plant them. They're, they're two new plants. That's a really important thing to do, because if you do that, the mother plant will now produce a pineapple for you. And typically, it's two to three years to get a pineapple. So, um, and it's usually during the winter. So um, yeah, it's, it's going like crazy. Now, we've got a lot of questions coming through the Facebook, uh, uh, Facebook chat, but um, don't be scared to send your questions through during the week as well. If we miss it today, and that's a, that's a risk, at least when we get it through um, our Facebook page, we'll collect those questions and I'll come back and answer them for you. Tommy, your question was, I have three, I have three cherry trees that stop fruiting at bearing leaves up the top. Now I suspect it could be possums or bats as I see them around. What can I do? Um, it's interesting if they stop fruiting. It really shouldn't stop them fruiting unless possums are eating the fruit before it develops, but you should see it developing. So it's a bit of an unusual thing. Cherries can be a little hit and miss sometimes. Um, I'm not 100% sure where you are, Pommy, but what I would suggest to you, if you're, if you're unsure, a little steel ring around about that big, around the base of your cherry trees will stop the possums from getting into them. Um, as far as uh, bats go, it's probably only netting that's going to stop them, but I doubt that that's what's causing the problem. I suspect it's maybe the trees have just not produced fruit, which sometimes happens. Okay, and you're in Melbourne. Good place to grow cherries, that's for sure. Okay, now uh, let's go to Joe Garrett. Okay, Joe, um, how can I rid my garden of the lovely windflower as it keeps growing through all my plants? It's very invasive. Uh, try to put them out uh, and they reroot and break off. Okay, so the windflower, the Japanese windflower, is one of those plants that some people would kill to have your problem with, and others, it's killing them because they have a problem with them seeding. They do seed. And of course they, um, they do produce lovely flowers, but they can become quite invasive. And the only way to really control it is to cultivate the soil around the outside of your other plants. So you're cult cultivating the seeds back in. And if you're getting any, any root runners popping up, that'll also allow you to take them out as well. A um, little bit of cultivation every day. There's an article just recently, CNN uh, in New York, launched this article, I couldn't believe it. They've just done some amazing research to work out that apparently gardening is good for you and it's a wonderful form of exercise. So I think that um, I think that the, the reality is if you can get out with a hoe for 15 minutes, uh, maybe twice a week, uh, one is it's very good exercise, two is it will help you get on, on top of any weeds because there's a lot of weed seeds germinating in my garden at the moment. I need to be in, in 
at home a little more often than I am here in Singapore so I can get on top of them before they become a problem too. All right, let's go. Uh, uh, Kerry McClure has asked about um, gardenias, pruning them. Lives in Rolling Stone in Perth. When's the best time to prune your gardenias? To be quite honest, any time of the year, they will respond to pruning quite well. They're not going to go backwards. So that's the first thing you need to know. When it comes to impacting flower, well, if you do it and they're producing buds, you're going to lose all your flowers. I would be giving them a prune as soon as they finish flowering, and that should help you. Julie Murphy, uh, you've got a question about um, tulip bulbs. Okay, got them from Garden Express last week. Told to put them in the crisper for a few weeks before planting. Uh, I also have some older bulbs I pulled up last year in dark cupboard. Now, I've also put them in the crisper. Does this help? Does it make any difference? You're in Rockingham, WA, and Julie, guess what? It actually doesn't make any difference. It is, and it's something that I used to believe as well, but it is a bit of a fallacy. Um, those tulip bulbs, they set their flowers in around October, November each year. So the flower is already being set. Uh, really, you, you can put them into the crisper, but the only time you want to do that is in October, November. That way, then you're going to get the chill hours into the bulb and it may help the flower set in the heart of the bulb. Uh, David Van Berkel taught me that from Garden Express. Uh, what David doesn't know about bulbs isn't worth knowing. So uh, I know that that's, a, uh, that's a, a good trick. So don't go thinking you have to do that. It's not going to make any difference to the, the flower this year. The flower, those bulbs have already come from a cool climate and the flower is already set in them. It's what happens after this flower that's really important. Okay, let's keep rolling through. Greg and Sarah Connell, you're in the central west of New South Wales. Why don't my Daphnis grow uh, so well? Actually, it's a really good question. Daphnis are an interesting plant. Some Daphnis, the, the species variety of Daphne, um, Odora, tends to get a virus. And this virus slowly sees the plant become quite stunted and drop its leaves. But there are some really good varieties of Daphne that are um, virus free. In fact, there's one that um, Anthony Tesla's put out, um, the, the, the plant marketing company, and it is, it's called Heaven Scent. It's got a, a white flower that's coming out now, and there's also a pink, uh, which was the first release. Absolutely stunning. Daphne, Heaven Scent, be full of foliage, grows really well in pots or in the ground. So hopefully, Greg and Sarah, that helps you guys. Of course, Daphne, uh, one of the, the most sweetest um, scented flowering plants you'll ever get. Linda Jones, how do I how do I weed a self-seeded everlasting patch? By hand, I'm afraid, Linda. Look at those, um, take a look at the, the broadleaf weeds and take them out. Uh, you'll see the grasses, take them out and leave the rest and you should be fine. Let's have a bit of a look down here. Jeanette Gilchrist, oh, great to have you with us again, Jeanette. Planted a mango tree, it's uh, two years in a pot, thriving. Should I transfer it into a bigger pot or into the ground? How long will it take to bear fruit? So pots tend to act a bit like um, a, a bonsaiing effect. They, they constrict the roots, and constricted roots usually means a smaller plant. So that's the first thing you need to keep in mind. However, a mango tree is really meant to grow to 20 metres tall by 15 metres wide, um, even more to be quite honest. And if it's one of those varieties, then you need to plant it in the ground in a place where you've got lots of room to, to get you know, all the potential of the tree. I should say there are dwarf mango trees available. There's quite a few great varieties. And I'm growing, I think I've got seven or eight in half wine barrels or large pots in my garden at home. And um, it's, a, it's a lovely way to, to be able to grow them and have them close to the places where you actually you know, will see them and use them and appreciate them. All right, let's keep rolling along. Tyson, you've got another question for me. Uh, can I please plant a mango tree in the ground or somewhere else? We're onto mango suddenly, citrus, mangoes. Um, Tyson, you can. Uh, Victoria is a pretty difficult place to grow mangoes. It's not impossible. I've seen them growing in places like St Kilda, actually doing quite well. Um, but if you get frosts, they're really going to struggle. So, uh, the best way uh, to go is to get a grafted tree onto a vigorous rootstock and in your instance, maybe actually grow it in a pot and have it so you can move it into a place where it is protected if you're moving into a really cold patch of weather and, uh, and that should, should keep it you know, safe and sound and you'll still get fruit, which is even better. Heather Cowie, hello, you're in Wanneroo in WA. 
possible to take cuttings from your fiddle leaf ficus, um, or am I too late? Uh, I'm going to show you one. Uh, have a look at this one over here. Uh, you see that's that's one in the background. Look at the size of that. Uh, they're, they're used extensively here at the Park Royal in Pickering. You'll see fiddle leaf ficus up there. They grow like crazy and they grow really well from cutting. So yes, you can cut the tops off. You can literally peel all the leaves off, maybe just leave one small leaf on and then pop the sticks in the ground. They should be about that long. So hopefully that, um, that helps from there. Now, I'm just juggling through a bit of advice from Shay Lee, but I think I'm, I'm okay. Um, let's have a look. Let's have a look. Who is next? Heather, uh, Kathy Mary Davidson. Hello, Kathy. Um, is it too cold to plant a tomato? Uh, you're in Pinjarra. It's the wrong time of the year to plant tomatoes now, so I wouldn't do it at all. They're going to suffer with diseases through the winter. Wait until probably October, I would recommend, Kathy. That's the best thing I can recommend. Um, Julie, let's have a look at you. Julie, southeast Queensland, when's the best time to prune my blueberry? Uh, Southwest Queensland, honestly, probably right now. Um, they're not far off. They'll start coming into producing flowers in the not too far distant future, which will end up being your fruit. So you don't want to ruin your crop. But I reckon about now is probably pretty good. Um, Candice Caruso, uh, again, I'm not sure where you are. I've been applying black marble to your herbs. Notice that my basil now has woody stem after about six months, which does spell the end of its life cycle. Uh, I've been able to keep basil plants in the past for up to four years by regular haircuts. That's pretty amazing. Um, black marble will no doubt accelerate the growth. It's not necessarily going to accelerate the life cycle. So I suspect that this is just, um, just one of those years where the plants got very woody. Uh, normally you would plant, if it's sweet basil, you'd plant it annually and treat it as an annual. And um, if you want a perennial one, you're going to get four or five years out of the perennial one, so you should be fine. Uh, okay, and you're on the Gold Coast of Queensland. That's why you're able to grow um, grow them for such a long period of time. It's usually the winter that shuts them down, so that's uh, that's all okay. Um, Tyson, uh, Mary, thank you. No, that's you're welcome. And Tyson, you're very welcome too, mate. Love having you on the show with us. Want to transplant a frangipani? Now, this is from Anne Gardner. Um, I was advised to wait until the winter. But I've also read spring. And you're in Wollongong in New South Wales. Okay, so here's the thing. You can transplant a frangipani any time of the year. But the best time to do it is really when they've gone dormant. And that, obviously, there's, there's two types of frangipani. There's an evergreen. Um, that's that's got to be transplanted any time of the year. And they do recover quite well from transplant. But the best results you'll get from the normal plumeria frangipani that the common one, um, is that you do it when it's gone dormant and you can take a lot of the root system off to transplant it and it won't set it back at all. So hopefully that helps. Kay Turner's in Adelaide and uh, she's got a question. Uh, interested in the pink flowering plant and the garden arch at the end of Saturday's program. Wondering whether it was an Antigonon. Uh, now that's, um, that's the coral rose. It's a, a, a vigorous climbing plant. And Kay, I think it was, now that you bring it up, I think it's exactly what it was. Um, so Antigonon leptus, I think is the, the, the correct name, but it's called the coral rose, or it's quite a vigorous climbing plant, but she has a very intense root system, just be conscious of that. Um, but it does look spectacular. Um, okay, let's keep going through, we'll roll through some more questions. Philomena is in Port Augusta. Hello, where can I buy the grey fiberglass pot you use to plant the lime tree? Um, okay, and that's a good question. Most garden centres have this new style of pot. Those pots are lightweight, they are incredibly tough, and they don't fade. So they're really good pots to get. A lot of, um, there's a lot of uh, pots out there these days in garden centres in different shapes and sizes. but. For those lightweight pots like the one that I, I used, uh, which probably weighed just a few kilos, um, they're a good way to go. <clears throat> okay, well, I think I'm losing my voice the way it's going. We've got so many questions. I'm going to do one more, and then we'll go to uh, a special offer from our friends at Garden Express. Stephen, he's in New South Wales. What soil is best for cactus and succulents? 
Okay, well that's a good question, Stephen, and the answer is really quite simple. It's got to be a free draining soil, a specialised cacti and succulent mix. You can buy them in bags. Osmocote awesome have, have it, and you can buy them, take it and use that. Or you can try and make your own. Now the trick is you need a combination of coarse river sand, cocoa peat, and maybe a little bit of bark in there as well, but, but very finely composted. Not a lot though. The, the measurements are very, very minimal when it comes to the organics because you really want that free, drone, uh, free draining effect to come through. Okay, keep sending your questions in. I'm going to take a, a moment's break and we're going to give you this very special offer from my friends at Garden Express. I hope. When you think of the Melbourne International Flower and Garden Show, you tend to think of exhibition gardens, but there is so much more to this show than that. There's all sorts of specialty things, including rare and unusual and collectible plants. If you're thinking of fuchsias, now's the time to be getting your hands on them, and this is the place to do it. Garden Express have a huge stand at the show, allowing people to meet the team face to face and ask questions. And you can buy everything you see on their online shop, including these fuchsias. David, absolutely fantastic display at the show again this year. Now, one of the areas that's incredibly popular is this one, and you're collaborating with another nursery, growing some pretty amazing, highly collectible plants. Yeah, Roger and Chris Grace from Wildview uh, Fuchsias yep, yep. have been doing this for 40 years. Wow. And, uh, and we've been working with them for about 15 years of that yep. um, with their beautiful range. You've got your sort of your uprights and then you've got your traditional hanging baskets. Now your uprights are beautiful to sort of create little hedges or do some sort of standardising. Yep. You know, get the elevation so those flowers are up where you, you can see them. Yep. Uh, and then of course your, your traditional hanging baskets, they're just delightful, you know, cascading down as the ones around us are, are doing. Now tell me, what's the best way to care for them? Look, the environment that we're standing in with, uh, with a little bit of shade, you want to protect them from that direct sunlight. Yep. Keep them nice and moist, so don't let them dry out too much. And then just regular feed. There's a lot of different varieties available, in fact, over 40. And some are now available for people to add into their home garden collection. And garden Express allow you to have them delivered direct to your door and to shop conveniently 24 hours a day, seven days a week. So Dave, Garden Guru viewers are not necessarily able to get here. We're obviously we're all over Australia. But those people that can't make Memphis, can you do a special deal for people? We can do a great deal for, for our viewers, Trip. We can do four of these beautiful pots, a collection of four for $38. It's a saving of 25%. That's an incredible deal. And on top of that, we've got 10 different collections to choose from. So you can go with the doubles, singles, or a mixture. Well, how good was that, hey? That, that David Van Berkel, he is one amazing guy. What he knows, I suppose this is the benefit of multi-generational businesses working in, um, working in the garden industry, these families that really know stuff and share it, you know, um, bring us some amazing plants. But in particular, these fuchsias are, well, they're just absolutely beautiful. Now, there is a bit of a thing you need to be aware of. This deal will not kick off until tomorrow morning. It's going to be live at 4.30, sorry, tomorrow afternoon, 4.30, Australian Eastern Standard Time, as Garden Express have got very limited stocks. There's 10 different future collections on offer. Each has got 400 mil pots in there and the discounted price, so the recommended retail price is 51.60 for that, but the discounted price is $38. That's why they're not going to last very long. So check it out. Hopefully you can get your order in nice and early. Maria Marino, hi, hello. Uh, Glenn Miller, great to have you with us, Glenn. Glenn's a great supporter of the Garden Gurus. Really appreciate that, mate. Um, if I prune back, let's say it's a three millimeter in diameter and prune it back to two, oh sorry, three meters down to two meters, I assume I have to keep feeding it at three meters because that's where the drip line would be. Ah, well, that's a good question. In actual fact, the root system will go all the way through. Your root system is fully developed. And the, the thing about the drip line, that's the outside edge of the canopy of the tree, is a lot of water drops around there. Not a lot of water gets the roots that are under the canopy of the tree, but the roots are still there and they will quickly grow and spread through that area. So um, feeding, you, you, 
be probably a metre, very, very gently spread lightly over that whole area. And, yeah, yeah you've said, sorry, it's harder to write than it is to verbalise, but I understand what you're saying. Look, it's a, it's a light feed on that sort of one metre area. The two, the, the current, the new canopy out to where the old canopy is and you'll be fine. So hopefully that, um, yeah, hopefully that helps you, Glenn. That's really good. I'm just looking through. I, I don't want to miss anybody. Um, and let's have a look. Gene Cunningham. Now, this is, a, this is a good one, right? I just got two big dogs that are killing the lawn, generally just playing and peeing. What can you do? I'd be worried at the moment, Gene, because if you're in Melbourne, your lawn should be at its absolute best. Really should be good. If the dogs are knocking it around now. Come winter time, you're really going to have some significant problems. Now, as far as the peeing goes, and I really should get our, our resident um, vet, Lydia, to, uh, to answer this, but one of the things that, that we've used, and it does have some effect, um, is certainly those dog rocks, and they're, they're basically charcoal rocks um, that you put in their water bowl when they're drinking. It's meant to have this effect of, of I suppose, neutralising the acid. Um, it's hit and miss. I've heard people are successful and some people are not. Uh, there's probably not a lot you can do other than making sure that you are feeding your lawn, you're watering your lawn, and it's getting full sun. Those things are the most important thing. If not, you need to start thinking about some lawn alternatives, and that's actually something else you can do. So a lawn alternative could be something like uh, dichondra, uh, kidney weed. Very, very good in that situation, and it tends to fill in the gaps, and, uh, and the lawn will still grow around the outside, and they'll just grow into each other. Hopefully that helps you. Um, Kathy Marie Davidson's asking the background, where am I? We've been on air now for 45 minutes or so, so you may have only just tuned in. This is one of Singapore's most spectacular, in fact, it's one of the world's most spectacular and green hotels. It is the Park Royal Pickering, and uh, I'm trying to do my best to give you a little bit of the vista. It is absolutely stunning. It's the first time we've We've actually done this uh, this live feed from overseas, so we were not quite sure how it was going to go. But um, at this location, um, I'm obviously up here filming the Garden Gurus for Singapore television. Um, we have a, a separate version of the Garden Gurus, which is all about gardening in the tropics. So um, that's, that's the whole purpose of being here at this hotel. And uh, you will see it in the show, or you may have seen it already in the show, but it really is stunning. It's amazing. So it is going crazy. Now, we've, we've received over 100 messages today, so we're doing pretty well for 40 minutes, I reckon. Uh, let's go to Carolyn Lothian. Now, um, have a row of little gems, and their leaves are falling off from the bottom to the top. Right, now that is occurring, Carolyn, for one reason and one reason only. The soil's got to be drying out. Um, you're probably best at this time of the year to be applying a wetting agent in around the base. They do have a habit of dropping them. Little gems are, of course, that wonderful evergreen magnolia, um, but they really do need to be protected when it comes to drying out because they will drop some foliage, and those leaves are big, crunchy leaves, so you don't want to have too much of that laying around. Uh, everybody's saying how good it looks. Uh, Nicole, it looks stunning. Tyson, love the background. Um, and Summit, Sharma, Summit, thank you so much for coming to us. What's the best time for grafting of roses? Well, the best time for grafting roses is usually November, December, depending on where you are. So um, they could go right through until January. So, um, and typically you do it as a bud. So you grow a, uh, a rootstock, which would be your base. It's usually a wild rose. And then you would take a bud off the, the one that you want. You'd make an incision and you'd slice the bud inside, tape around the outside, and you'll end up with a, an incredible rose bush. It's a very effective way to do it. Um, I'm glad you're all loving the hotel. It is magnificent. It is absolutely beautiful. I'm just checking that I haven't missed anybody here um, on your questions because there are a lot of questions coming through and the screen scrolls pretty quickly. So uh, I just want to make sure I'm covering everybody. I think I have. Um, and Tyson, Jean with your dogs, Glenn, um, Maria, Mel, thank you so much. Um, what was the few, 
what was the future online called Giz? Mel, I'm not sure. I think we'll ask our friends at, uh, at Garden Express because I'm not sure what you're really asking there. I'll, I'll look into it. It's obviously a variety of fuchsia. We'll have to have a look at that and come back to you. Um, maybe that was on the Garden Express page or maybe it's on one of our pages. I'll check it. Um, I think Shay Lee might be onto that one already as we speak. Uh, let's keep moving through. How do I stop Slater's under AstroTurf on wooden deck? It's impossible. Um, Slater's, the other name for Slater's is wood lice. They love wood. They tend to eat um, organic matter that is dead and uh, they will start doing that. The perfect environment is to go and lay uh, artificial turf over the top of wood and uh, you're creating the perfect environment for Slater's. Uh, you could you could treat them, you could put some baits, some brand baits down, you could spray carbaryl, but um, gee, it's probably the, the structure that's uh, the problem here. Um, your comments are still flowing through about how magnificent this place is. You need to remember that if we've actually got a competition running where you could win a trip for two for four nights staying here at, this is the Park Royal Pickering, but there's a Park Royal in Marina Bay. Park Royal Pickering is known as the hotel in a garden and the Park Royal in Marina Bay is known as the, ho uh, the garden in a hotel because the inside of that hotel is magnificent and I'll try and show that to you at some point in the future as well. But yeah, you know, enter the competition, jump online. I've given you the hint as to what the, the, the answer to the question is too. So uh, check it out. Yeah, it's a, it'd be a great prize. Um, really cool. Okay, let's keep rolling through. We'll go to Jody Taylor. I'm not sure where you're from. You're asking what's a good time to repot Queen of the Night. Now, I think you're talking about the Epiphyllum Queen of the Night. This a few plants that actually have that common name, but the epiphyllum queen of the night is actually, it's been through a flowering process recently, so I'm sure that's probably the one that um, that we're talking about. Now, when it comes to queen of the night, if it's the epiphyllum, which is a cactus, uh, a type of cactus, uh, you do plant them now. You do pot them up right now in most parts of Australia. Uh, if it, you're in a really cool environment, that may be a bit of a problem. So. Um, you might be better to wait until the springtime, but hopefully that helps. Okay, trying to avoid missing anybody because your questions are coming through thick and fast. How do you order those fuchsias online? You do it with gardenexpress.com.au and of course the important thing to remember is you can only do it from 4.30 tomorrow afternoon, so please keep that in mind. Christine Rankin, oh yeah Christine, thank you for helping out. Linda Jones, a lot of people struggle with fuchsias, why? How hard can they be? Now, Linda is from Gosnells, and uh, they're cool, Linda. I've actually got them growing outside in full sun in my garden. One of the big trends in Europe at the moment, particularly places like uh, the UK and Ireland, is they're used extensively um, as, as plants that you would actually um, hedge. So there's some very upright forms. Um, the only reason people struggle with fuchsias generally is their environment gets very hot. Fuchsias can't handle it too hot or too dry, so don't ever let them dry out is really the key message here. And feed them on a regular basis and you can't go wrong. All right, um, okay, Annie Michelades, I think I've got that right. Annie, hello, I recently purchased crepe myrtle with flower buds ready to go. I've reported in a, uh, I've repotted it into a slightly bigger pot, fed up, there's no flowers. Do I leave it or prune it? It's got all its foliage on and it's showing flower buds it'll produce flowers but if it's little round balls at the end of the the foliage that's actually fruit so it's setting seed um, either way it's about to drop its leaves pretty soon and it will be a good time to give it a prune back so it's up to you annie i hope that helps but i suspect it's probably more seeds you've got than flower buds because pretty much all the crepe myrtles have finished flowering uh let's keep going along here um, all right here we go I'm a gift bearer I'm in Georgia USA we expected to have a cold snap through to May will that ruin my chances of getting full term peaches from my peach tree this year well if you do get a cold snap early it can affect crops um, I'm, I'm blown away because it's great to have somebody from the USA joining us as well um, the answer is of course that you know any extreme weather event and that that's really heavy frosts 
particularly if you get snow, um, there is a tendency for these plants to drop their fruit. If the fruit's relatively well developed, they won't reflower. If it's very tiny, they might have a shot at flowering again and producing some more fruit. But you've really just got to hope that you get a good run right through, well, May, June, July. Obviously, you, you'll be picking uh, later in the season. But, yeah, there you go. You've really got me thinking because now we're in the Northern Hemisphere, which uh, is, is a bit of a challenge. Annie, thank you for your uh, your feedback. You're in Perth. Mel, um, thank you. Uh, thank you. I think, think that's great. Um, and let's just keep rolling. There's a lot of questions sitting here. Uh, Nicole, back... Bag in. I hope I got that right, Nicole. Please excuse me if I didn't. Um, how often do we have to feed our citrus tree? Now, they're full of flowers right now. If you're going to feed them, feed them right now when they're in flower because right at this moment, the plant is taking a snapshot of how much moisture it gets, how much fertiliser it's got available to it, and that'll determine the size of the fruit that's going to grow. If you feed later on when the fruit's on the tree, you'll often find that you'll find oranges that split. And it's because people fed, the, uh, fed them more watered them more and the fruit just keeps growing and growing and growing but it grows beyond what its original maximum size was going to be which forces it to split open. Hopefully that helps you understand why you do get those splitting events occasionally but manipulating the environment by putting in fertilizers is is really one of those things where you can either get larger fruit or you can cause problems with fruit and uh, you, you mentioned also that you're in Melbourne so that's um, that's really good. And also, I'm a gift bearer. It also mentions that uh, uh, you've had lots of rain as well. Well, lots of rain, not such a bad thing for, for uh, peaches, that's for sure. Um, let's keep rolling through all of our questions. We really are busy. Um, yep, so Charlene, I think, helped Mel Morrow, which is great. And... Oh, let's go to Glenn Miller. The answer about balls on the ends of the great myrtle foliage is great help. I thought there were flowers waiting to open and possibly hadn't given it enough water, thanks for your advice. Your trees have done all the hard work. They produce their flower. They're now producing seed. They're coming to the end of the season. They'll then, then go dormant and, and rest for a period of time. So, yeah, you can leave that seed on and you can collect the seed and you can try and grow it. it it's actually usually quite viable and very, very effective. All right, I think we're getting towards the end of the feed. We are, and uh, and uh, it's great to see you guys also interacting with each other. Uh, Annie and Glenn, you've both had the same problem. You're helping each other out. Um, Heather Crow's doing the same thing, replying to Linda. Um, she's had fuchsias, and she's diligent in keeping them wet and in the shade. Actually let them sit in a full saucer of water and also use self-watering pots. Never let them dry out, but I'm a bit remiss with the fertilizer and pruning. Actually, it's a, it's a good point, Heather. The, there's, there is a point where you can go too far too. So you don't get them too wet. That can be a, a bit of a problem. So don't leave them sitting in bowls or trays of water for too long. If, uh, if that water's getting taken back up within a day or so of you watering the plant, great. But if you've just got a nice, cool spot and you've got a situation where the water can drain through, it's the perfect environment for them. Uh, sitting in water, is always a, a little bit of a problem. Uh, Summit Sharma, you've got a really good question here. I'm always confused between premium, uh, I think this is um, potting mix, and no normal soil. Which one's good for veggies? So you can get a veggie mix, uh, pre-mix in a bag, or you can buy it bulk in trailers or deliver to your house from a truck. Um, when it comes to growing vegetables, you want the very best quality soil. If you're doing it in pots, I would use a premium potting mix. If you're, if you're doing it in a garden, I would get a special veggie mix. It's a lot better. You're, uh, you're all having one, one last run at us, which is great. Oh, we've got another one from um, Sunshine Garden in Missouri. Hello, welcome. Welcome to the show. I'm in Singapore, the beautiful Park Royal uh, on Pickering, which is just gorgeous. Love to have our friends in the Northern Hemisphere in the US joining us. I've got two more questions I'm going to answer and then we're gonna wind up for the day. I've got a big day ahead of me and then I'm coming home tonight, so lots of work to be done. Two questions. Let's go to, well, one is a thanks from Nicole uh, back in um, about your citrus issue. Um, hopefully that does help you, Nicole. Um, beautiful sunny weather in Melbourne today. Give it a feed, you can't go wrong. Um, Mattia, 
Jairendra, Jairendra, sorry, Mattia. Um, you're in Sydney. You've got poor, poor trees. Can I plant them now? Wait till October. Actually, uh, Jairendra, I would, Jairendra, I would definitely, if I was you, um, hold off. Keep them in pots. Let them get quite large. Get through the winter. The cooler months is not the best time to be having poor, poor trees trying to establish. And as soon as it starts get to, to get a bit warm, um, then I would plant them out. Uh, Pommy uh, must be very hot and humid in Singapore right now. It is really hot. It's quite humid. It's always humid up here. But um, the wet season is just finishing. The dry season is about to come. They only have two seasons up here. And the dry season can get really hot. And Kathy Mary Davidson, thanks very much for your comment. She said, I look forward to your live feed every day. Um, and um, and I hope that you give everybody. Thanks very much. Love the show on TV too. Thanks so much. Um, there is one more question. Uh, actually, was, again, you guys are helping each other out, which is wonderful. I love this, this sense of community we have. Um, Tyson helping Kathy Mary Davidson out. I might have missed that. Do you need two avocados? Yes, you do. Avocados have a, some varieties are relatively self-fertile, but having two different types, and there's a reason for it, because some have their flowers, um, so they all tend to have male and female flowers, but they open in the morning, uh, the males and some, and in the afternoon on others. And then in other varieties, it's the reverse way around. So what you want to do is bring them together so you're getting that cross-pollination. You want the male and the female flowers open at the same time. Have a talk to your garden centre when you go in there. Best to get grafted varieties for a start. Make sure you get two compatible forms. Pop them into the garden. You can get beautiful dwarf varieties as well now, and that really does um, that really does guarantee you some amazing crops. Avocados are a great tree to grow, and of course the fruit so expensive. When you look at spending 30, 40, 50, 60 dollars on a tree, um, you sort of get that money back maybe in the second or third year, uh, just in the value of fruit. So it's worthwhile growing them. Last but not least today, um, Summit. I've always struggled to keep my Indian basil. Um, plant alive in the Australian environment. They died pretty much every year. Well, that's because they don't like the cold. And so they do want it to be warm. You get yourself one of those amazing Sproutwell glass houses or greenhouses, you can even get the little ones and, um, and pop it in there. You might get it through the winter. It does need to be protected though. If not, collect the seed because they will seed a lot. Collect the seed and keep planting. Hopefully that helps you some. I'll tell you what, what a day. We're, um, We've done an amazing job. Uh, got a big thank you to say to, to, to say to Shaylee. You never get to see Shaylee. She's always in the background pushing buttons, making sure I'm informed on what's going on. And she's done an amazing job again today. So I'm so grateful for all that hard work. We're a very, very fortunate team to have such great people uh, here at the Garden Gurus. And um, we're really looking forward to, to bringing you some more of the Garden Gurus tomorrow on Channel 9, right across Australia. Check your local guides the best way you can guarantee that you're going to see the latest show. Of course, on Nine Life, you're seeing lots of shows. And if you want to watch it, when you want to watch it, Nine Now, it's really broadcast video on demand. It's the best thing ever. It means you can do that. So a uh, little bit of advice, how soft smoothie whilst I'm in Singapore, Pommy, had it last night. I'm onto it. Don't worry. So many great things up here. This is the, I'll show it to you one more time. This is the Park Royal. In fact, I didn't even show you that, but this is the hotel, the Park Royal Pickering. You can see how high above the street I am. And then above me, just rows and rows. And what's, what's remarkable about this hotel is that the footprint of the hotel sits on 15,000 square metres. But there are over 17,000 square metres of gardens wrapped over and around this hotel. It's the future of building. And it's so exciting. I'm so fortunate to have been here to enjoy it. I do have to go back to work now. I hope today has been a big help for you and your garden. Thank you so much for your loyalty and your support. Don't forget the key word, if you want to win that beautiful Troforte pack, is fertilizer. I see it just there. All right, well look, I'm Trevor Cochran. Thanks so much for joining us. Look forward to seeing you tomorrow, hopefully on Channel 9 for the Garden Gurus. If not, I'll see you next week. I might be